so much for being here. Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm so pleased to see you all here. My name is Lisa Lampert Weisig, and I'm the director of the Jewish Studies Program here at UCSD. And I'm um, so happy to be able to um, have uh, host Professor Yuval Gadot. We're going to hear about his work this evening. Um, before he gets a proper introduction from Professor Tom Levy, his colleague, I just want to tell you about a few upcoming events that we have. Um, and the first will be on January 10th. This is going to be a Zoom interview between Lauren Schlomberg, um, who you might know from the American Klezmer Band, the Klezmatics, and our own Amelia Glazer. Um, so that'll be at 5 p.m. on January 10th, and we'll be sending out a link for that very soon. Um, and then on February 6th in the evening, starting at 5, we're going to be able to celebrate the chair installation of Professor Glazer, who's been named to a chair in Judaic studies. So those events will be coming up in the winter. Can everybody hear me? Is this working? OK. Um, and um, on May 4th, we will have our annual lecture to celebrate Jerome and Miriam Katzen and their memory. And um, that will be a lecture by Professor Melissa Weininger, who has a book coming out on Israeli literature. She's an expert in modern Yiddish and Israeli texts. And she'll be speaking with us on May, for us on May 4th. Um, so I'm very excited this evening about the Professor Godot's lecture. He's been a visiting professor here in the Department of Anthropology in the fall quarter. And that visit was made possible through a partnership with the Murray Gallinson San Diego Israel Initiative. He's one of several professors um, that the um, Gallinson program has brought to UCSD. And um, he's the fifth that we have partnered with Gallinson with um, to bring through the Jewish Studies program. And I um, want to give a big shout out and thank to Susan Lapidus and the Gallinson program um, for making these visits possible, and also to um, the Division of Arts and Humanities. Um, Dean Della Coletta is here. Thank you so much um, for supporting these visits as well. And Dean Carol Padden of the School of Social Studies is also here, and I want to recognize um, and thank them for coming and thank them for their support of the program and our partnership with the Gallinson Initiative. Um, so um, 
And finally, I want to give a big thank you to Jen Swartzkoff, who is our program coordinator. She couldn't be here this evening. And especially Maddie Martinez, standing in the back, who planned this entire event. Um, she's been working tirelessly on this, and I really appreciate all of her efforts. And I will also recognize the Brit Lit crew from my class who showed up. So thanks for coming, guys. And without further ado, I'm going to let Professor Levy, Professor Tom Levy, um, introduce Yuval Gadot. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, and um, I'm really honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Yuval Gadot. But I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Uh, Yuval Gadot is not related to the Israeli actress Gal Gadot. You don't know how much I was hoping that was true. Yuval, but um, It's hard to believe that I've been part of the UC San Diego Jewish Studies program for 30 years as an archaeologist, let alone a faculty member on this campus for all those years. It has been a great experience. However, I retired the 1st of July this year. Retire Are there any retired people in the audience? Raise your hands. <laughs> Retirement is good. Seth, where's Seth? Seth, it's good. Um, some of my friends here have asked what I've been doing now uh, being retired. Well, a lot of underwater archaeology in Israel and Greece. I'm pleased to say that I'm a research fellow at the University of Haifa's Reconati Institute for Maritime Studies and was recently appointed head of the steering committee of the new National Infrastructure Center for Archaeological Science. This is a joint University of Haifa Israel Antiquities Authority project with professors Israel Finkelstein, Ruth Shachar Gross, Guy Bar Oz, and Asaf Yassur Landau. Uh, two days ago, the Israel Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology awarded us a major grant to get the center started. I'm extremely excited to be part of this. As I fade into the sunset here at UC San Diego, I'm grateful to my dean, Carol Padden. Where's Carol? Carol is here. There she is in the back. Um, she's here this evening especially for supporting the immediate academic search in the Department of Anthropology to replace me as the holder of the Norma Kershaw Chair in the Archaeology of Ancient Israel and Neighboring Lands. Keeping the connection between UC San Diego and the academic community in Israel is so important for both countries. Thank you, Carol, so much. I'm still involved with the Qualcomm Institute Center for Cyber Archaeology and Sustainability. To make it more sustainable, we invited Dr. Neil Smith to join me as co-director of the center. Where's Neil? There he is in the back. Earlier this month, thanks to a generous gift from Marion Scheuer Sofer. Marion, where are you? There she is. And her husband, Abe Sofer of Palo Alto we were able to launch a virtual reality tour program of the famous biblical site of Tel Dan on the northern border of Israel for the Archaeology Museum of the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. Neil and his students created an avatar of the excavator, the famous biblical archaeologist Avram Biran, who died in 19, uh, who was born in 1909 and died in 2008. We resurrected Professor Biron, and using neural networks, Neil's team cloned Biron's memorable voice. And um, I guess, would anybody here like to experience that VR program? Okay, well, Neil, we're gonna organize something. Okay, for tonight, the last time Professor Gadot spoke to our Jewish studies audience, Hamas rockets from the Gaza Strip were raining down all over Israel, and Yuval told us he might have to be 
leaving our Zoom lecture and seek shelter with his family as the sirens went off. Fortunately, there was a, there was a lull in the attack and we were treated to a lecture by one of Israel's leading archeologists working in Jerusalem. Professor Gadot is currently a visiting professor here at UCSD, thanks to the support of the Murray Gallinson San Diego Israel Initiative, directed by Susan Lapidus, who we, let's ask her to step, uh, step up again and just thank her. her. Her work is so important for us. Yuval is the head of the Department of Archaeology and Ancient Near Eastern Cultures at Tel Aviv University and will soon also become the head of the Institute of Archaeology at Tel Aviv University that oversees the large number of excavations carried out by the faculty there. I first met Yuval in 2003 when he was a research fellow at the Nelson Glick School of Biblical Archaeology at the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. I was passing through from Jordan. Yuval has a distinguished career of fieldwork, publication, teaching, and service. Yuval currently chairs 12 PhD committees. Are they on strike? I don't no, not, 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 not right now. Pr probably now. Um, Professor Godot has published seven books, you have to sign mine, uh, and monographs and over 70 peer-reviewed journal articles, most in top international journals, over 27 book chapters, and much more. Since 2013, Yuval directs the Tel Aviv University excavations in the city of David in Jerusalem and co-directs the Lautenschlanger, I think my German is not good, um, Azeka expedition. His research in Jerusalem includes excavations of the ancient core of the city, together with interdisciplinary studies of the rural landscape surrounding the city. Jerusalem is a contentious city, as you all know. However, as a religious center for Jews, Christians, and Muslims, Research and conservation of its rich history is paramount. Yuval is helping to lead the way in applying 21st century archaeological methods to one of the world's most important cultural heritage sites. This evening, Yuval will speak on Jerusalem's elite during the 7th century BCE in light of recent archaeological research. Please give Yuval a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, because every time in the lectures I get excited at the end, I wanted to say all the thank yous at the beginning and know that I did my, my part and not run away without thanking somebody. I'm not thanking only for the lecture. I've been here now for this entire trimester uh, since the 15th of September, uh, enjoying the quiet life of San Diego. Uh, and there, there are so many people involved in making sure that this time will be fruitful. Uh, my commitment is that in, in a year and a half there will be a book about the archaeology of Jerusalem and I was able to write a lot so I'm very very grateful for, ev for everybody. You see the names there, I don't want to uh, forget somebody so thank you again everybody and, and now we can, I, I can relax and we can go on to speak about Jerusalem. <laughs> well, uh, the archaeology of Jerusalem presents an enigma. Uh, we all think that we know everything about Jerusalem. It's well written uh, historically, a place that is documented uh, in the Hebrew Bible, in the New Testament, in other sources outside of the Bible, even in the archaeology of Jerusalem, we find the name Jerusalem on things. This is just a few years ago, uh, the name of somebody from Yerushalayim found on, on inscribed on a, on a stone from the Roman period. And it's been excavated for 150 years. There aren't so many places that being, are being excavated again and again uh, by different uh, missions, different techniques, uh, universities, expeditions from all over the world has, have been excavating there. And um, our generation is probably not the last. And at the same time, uh, we are missing so many key periods when we talk about the archaeology. The debate over the historicity of the 
times of David and Solomon kind of made it into the public arena. But it's not only that period that is missing. The Late Bronze Age, we hear about a king called Abdichepa writing from Jerusalem. We have no, almost no archaeology remains from that period. And if we go to the Persian period, the time of the returnees in Hamaya's city that I've quoted at the beginning, um, there's almost nothing. It's changing a little bit now. You'll see maybe towards the end of the lecture. Uh, but we are, we are missing. There is kind of a conflict between the text and uh, the archaeology. And this is especially true for periods that are prayer of this moment. This is, if everybody visited the Israel Museum, when you see there the model, uh, the Holy Land model of, of Jerusalem in the Roman period, the time of Herod, first century CE. Uh, he was a great builder, and he also made sure that there's nothing from earlier periods left, almost. Um, and um, it's very hard to find things from earlier periods under this veil uh, that Herod uh, created. To that, we have to add something that may sound a little bit uh, awkward uh, after naming Jerusalem as a kind of a place of a conflict. What were, you, you used the word uh, before, a better word than I. Uh, archaeologists are kind of living on destructions. Uh, it's not a nice thing to say, but destructions are better preserv preserving uh, the archaeological evidence. Uh, you have here an image from Azeka and an image from the destruction of Hatzor. When, when destruction happens, uh, things are left in sight, and then you can, the archaeologists can start doing their work. But when you look at uh, Jerusalem and you compare it to places like Azeka, Megiddo, Hatzor, Jerusalem, in its archaeology, of course, almost has no moments of destructions. It's probably had a more violent history than, we, than the archaeology tells. But if we go to earlier periods, I always say that Jerusalem has one and a half destruction layers. The one is what you see the, the lower picture. This is from the Roman period. The Romans were very, very thorough, and Jerusalem was completely destroyed uh, in 70 CE. And the destruction layer is found everywhere. Anybody is excavating in Jerusalem had to go through the destruction of the, or by the Romans. And the half destruction is the destruction by the Babylonians, 586 BCE, 500 years earlier than the Romans. And um, they did not destroy the whole city. You, we find this destruction here and there, and I'll be talking about that in, uh, later. Apart from that, Middle Bronze, Late Bronze, Early Bronze, all of these periods that at Megiddo, you can, as, I as a student, dug through something like seven or eight destruction layers in, in the history of the site. Nothing of that uh, was discovered in Jerusalem. It means that the, the, the preservation of finds is not as good as it, would, it, would, it, as it is in other places. So it's a very, very complicated site. And at the end, after 150 years, and after reading the biblical text, and after knowing, thinking that we know so much, archaeologists are still fighting over the very, very basic questions of where exactly is Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem located, and what is its size and nature in critical early periods, uh, where is the core of the city, and I will share some of this later on, and what can we say about Jerusalem becoming a, a religious center, a, a political center, an economic center, uh, how, what can we say about that? So th these are very basic questions that are usually handled in the next, like let's say, the first two or three years of the excavations, and then you can go deeper, and we are, we are still facing these arguments. I will not talk about all of that. I will concentrate today on a more specific period, a period that we do have a historical knowledge or textual knowledge from, and, but it's still, a, I think we, we are a, a able to bring a, different, a little bit different light than what you read in the biblical text. And I will concentrate on the 7th century BCE, the time that Jerusalem was really at its height, a, and you'll see in a minute, and, and going all the way to the destruction of 586 BCE, and the new finds and how we understand the elite of Jerusalem in, in those moments. This is the time that Jerusalem was under the Assyrian yoke, uh, the Assyrian Empire, and I will try to show how, how they are maneuvering in, in those moments between the kind of the local identity and uh, uh, the, the desire of the empire. If we have time, I will also show two or three more slides, slides that talk about after the destruction, the kind of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, uh, but we'll see as it goes. I have to introduce some kind of very basic uh, topographical thing, uh, names, just so we have kind of common knowledge when, when, we, when we are talking about Jerusalem. This is a model that was made by Konrad Schick at the beginning of the 20th century. 
It's still located in Jerusalem. You can actually see the model. It's not an air picture. It looks like an aerial picture, but it's a model of the topography after peeling off the uh, old city, which you can see here. If you will follow the cursor, you can see the line of the northern wall uh, of, of old Jerusalem today, not ancient Jerusalem. So at, the, at this spot, you can see Temple Mount, but as a mountain, okay? Ignore the Herod's podium and ignore uh, all the construction on top of the podium. You actually have a mountain there, Mount Moria, maybe the name, uh, which is as its peak, and then it slowly goes up, uh, it goes down to, towards the south. And when you go south, you reach this very, very narrow ridge that is the kind of dissected from all directions, except for the north, uh, by valleys. To its right in the picture or east uh, is the valley of Kidron, and to its left, and, and kind of dissecting in between, is the valley which is called the Teropeon Valley, or the Central Valley, a valley that is very, very deep, but have disappeared over the generations. If you visit Jerusalem, and some of you I heard just came there from two weeks ago, or are going in two weeks ago, uh, if you'll ask people where is the Teropeon, it's not there, it's gone. Uh, but it's been rebuilt and rebuilt, and it was very, very uh, uh, influential on the, on the town planning, as you'll see. And west of the Teropeon is the Western Hill, or Mount Zion, where the Domitian Abbey is today, where the Jewish Quarter and the Armenian Quarters are built. Uh, so these three hills, together with the two valleys, are kind of telling us the story, and I will be using these terms as we go along. And when you ask most archaeologists where did Jerusalem begin, they will point to the Gihon Spring, which is located down uh, at, the, at, the, at the Kidron Valley, down from the, the city of David Ridge, or the southeastern ridge. Uh, and it's an affluent spring. It, it has a lot of water throughout the year, permanent, and you can base a city on that. It's not just we need to drink or uh, the animals need to drink. It's also a political power for anybody living in the Near East. If you, if you put your control over this tap, you are in control of life in the highlands of Jerusalem, and it becomes also like a vault. This is like, if I want to show off my, uh, my powers, this is where I will build huge towers and so on. And it makes sense that Jerusalem kind of sparkled there, but it only creates a kind of a problem because if that's the core, then the spring is downhill and it's very, very hard to defend it. And it's also very hard to defend the ridge of, that is called the city of David Ridge. Uh, and, and maybe that's part of the explanation why we are not finding some of the periods. Most scholars, however, are on, in the opinion, and I am too, uh, that Jerusalem began here and expanded northward towards Temple Mount later on, and then also towards uh, the, uh, the, the Western Hill in later periods. But the core is the, the city of David. There is a different model uh, suggested by Sai Finkelstein and the Lifshitz and Ido Koch, saying that maybe we are missing all the periods because the ancient tale of Jerusalem is below Herod's Temple Mount. And actually, when the city kind of sprang out, became bigger, it went southward and westward uh, from that location. So it's a kind of a different model that says that the spring is not the essential place, but actually the high hill where the Acropolis may have been, uh, and so on. And there are many problems with this model. I don't agree with that uh, in, in relation to all the periods, but when we come to the period that I'm focusing on to, uh, tonight, uh, there is something to think about. Okay, like, okay, Jerusalem began by the spring, and that's the location of the city, but it's somewhere close to the end of the 8th century or maybe the beginning of the 7th century. King Hezekiah is uh, who most people claim uh, moved the water in an underground tunnel from one side of the hill to the other side of the hill and kind of made the, the, the part that is uh, where the spring is kind of redundant. You don't need to go anymore to the spring because you can go to the Silwan pool on the other side. And then the western slopes of this ridge become more important as there is an axe, a road, that connects between the pool and probably the temple that stood above. So somewhere in the 8th, close to the end of the 8th century, or maybe the beginning of the 7th century, Jerusalem kind of tilted westward uh, from an east orientation to a west orientation. Probably the, the spring remained important. Uh, probably this, the, you know, the urban kind of infrastructure was still alive. 
In 586 BC, when the city was destroyed and then rebuilt, I don't think they had any reason to go back to the spring, and then the city is moving westward completely. So it's a kind of a long process. And the 7th century BC, where we are going to, is the beginning of that process. And the spot that you're seeing here in, in black, that's where I, our excavations are being conducted. An area that is becoming from the back of the city for thousands of years in the Middle Bronze, Late Bronze, Iron, beginning of the Iron Age, and so on, to uh, this spot, the uh, central station, something that connects between the temple, the western hill where everybody's living, uh, the pool where the water are, uh, and so on. So this is like the, the hub of the city that is expanding westward. And that's what we're going to see. And you, you'll be able to understand that there, that's the elite quarters of the city. We are talking about a moment that Jerusalem is fortified. There's no doubt about that. The fortifications were found everywhere. Uh, there are elite residents in different quarters of the city. We see administration in all kinds of forms. Royal administration with the stamping on the handles, uh, bullas that are telling us about uh, stamps that people are using, and so on. So the city is very vibrant and very alive and has its symbols with these stone decorated capitals that are found also in Jerusalem, but not all, only in Jerusalem. And that's the size from a nucleus of something like 100 dunams. It becomes, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 10 hectares. It becomes a city of uh, 60 or 70 hectares. It's, it's much larger. It's, it's very, very big, and it's very alive in that sense. It's the biggest city in the kingdom of Judah in those moments. And the Givati excavations, where we are going, the area at the lower part of the picture, is actually the first time we are able to see a window into those periods in that part of the city. Uh, this is exactly the same area 100 years ago. And uh, actually, if you want to make, I can pinpoint that road here, is probably this pass between the fields here. And um, it's also the reason why nobody excavated that area. The Kidron, on the other side, you can see the, the slope, you can understand uh, the, the remains, it's easy to get to them. Here you have to excavate something like uh, 10 meters below surface, exaggerated, 7 meters below surface to get to the Abbasid period, 10th century C. Okay, uh, so most archaeologists decided no, there's no reason for us to excavate here and it was kind of left neglected. Corford in the 1920s, a British excavator, uh, excavated there and then it was rebuilt and we don't really understand what was found by him. Kathleen Kenyon, a very famous British archaeologist dug there in the 1950s, uh, did a small window, it was never published. And so like we don't know really until that moment, in all generations we have no idea what's going on in that part of the city. Since 2003, the Israeli Antiquities Authority uh, began an excavation there, Doron Ben Ami and Yana Chekhanovich, and, and they really created a huge window. Uh, this is unparalleled to any other excavations uh, in Israel. Uh, uh, Ten years of consecutive excavations and very, very broad uh, picture. Um, and in this project, they were able to document layers from the 10th century CE, Abbasid period, all the way to the 9th century BC, all of these layers that they have excavated. In 2017, uh, they stopped their excavations for various reasons, and, and Tel Aviv University, together with the Israel Antiquity Authority, said, uh, you, you just got to the interesting period. Sorry for anybody who's caring about the Roman periods. Uh, the Persian, the Hellenistic, pre hasmonean city, all of these missing periods, there's a chance to go and, and find them. And we initiated a project that has different aims, but the main, main aim was to find remains from earlier than the Hasmonean layers going to the Iron Age uh, city. Uh, it's a partnership with the, that I'm leading together with Iftah Shalev from the Israeli Antiquity Authority, and uh, there is a lot of information coming out. And uh, I'm focusing on what is called here Area 10. Uh, just so you understand where we are within the topography of the city, uh, you see here the lines AA and BB. These are sections in the rock, the way the rock slopes down. So A and B at the top are the top of the hill, and A and B at the bottom of the picture are the top, the, the going down into the Teropeon, into the valley that has disappeared. And that's where we found the remains. Later remains were removed by the Romans, so nothing was really preserved. But the building that we are going to talk about is located downslope. 
But remember that there were probably buildings all, also all the way up. It's not standing isolated in a valley. It's kind of within uh, uh, the, the city's tissues. It's not uh, by itself, and it's not alone uh, down in the slope. But it is com coming, going close to the road that I mentioned. And uh, we are here. Ashler Building 100, this is where we are, we are going. All of these blue, sorry, green lines. Let's jump on these pictures. That's the, the main, what we found of, of this one building. You can easily recognize here three rooms. Just if you compare the size of the building to other public buildings known in Jerusalem from excavations, uh, you can see that it's one of the largest. And we excavated only part of it. So except for the purple building, the Royal Warehouse, that was found by Elat Mazar by the Ophel, very close to Temple Mount. This is the second largest building, public building, we know of in Jerusalem. And this is how we reconstruct the picture, the, the building, and I will try to convince you over the next few minutes that there's nothing uh, accidental in this reconstruction of the building. And uh, it's challenging to, de to define the building because it's not uh, you, we don't see here any domestic activities, we don't see any production activities, and so on. You'll see the kind of activities we have remains from. So here is Iftach standing and watching over the excavations in room B, and already in front of him you can see uh, this use of worked stones, which is very rare in Jerusalem. Usually they are using field stones for the walls, and here there's a facade that is made by very nice stones, and you can see here uh, the use of these stone pillars as a kind again whoop, uh, to decorate the building themselves. I will, I will use this technology. Here you can see these stone pillars that are standing in, in front. All of these already told us that we are talking about a, a building of a different magnitude and we have to understand that. This is a, probably a frame of a window that was on the upper floor that fell inside the collapse and we understand now that these standing pillars were actually holding a second floor. So this building had two stories, and, and maybe the window is coming from the second story, together with this beautiful sink that was used, so there's running water. I'm, I feel like a salesman trying to sell the, the building. We have running waters. We also have a fragment of a stone capital that I showed you before that is typical of Judah of the 7th century BCE. Uh, it was found in a fragment. It's not really clear how it relates to the building, but, but it's probably originating from the building itself and the ashlers that we've seen. The floor of the second story uh, was found within the destruction, and you can see it here in ruins, and when you find the floor within the destruction, it means that it's coming from above your head, and this ch big chunk of charcoal is actually a wooden beam that probably supported uh, that floor, and there are no floors like that in, in Iron Age Jerusalem. We, when we found it, everybody said, oh, this is probably Roman, Herod, and so on. But no, it's really related to the building. We invited Yoav Vaknin, who works in cooperation with San Diego University on Apollo magnetism. And Yoav measured the orientation of the magnetic north uh, of that floor. And uh, in the publication itself, we kind of uh, used uh, paleomagnetism is trying to date the movement of the magnetic north of the Earth. They need the archaeologists at this stage, so Yoav was relying on us knowing that the destruction is 586, the memory uh, of the 9th of Av, uh, in order to say, and now if somebody excavates a site in Israel or in Jordan and doesn't know uh, if it's dating to 586 or 620 or 570, he can relate, he can take samples and then relate to that article and say, oh, it's different than Jerusalem or it's similar to Jerusalem. So it's becoming like a peg within a, a very long chain. And you have also measured the, 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 the kind of studied the, the, uh, the infrastructure of the floor, the floor itself. This is a beautiful floor. It also almost feels like, uh, I don't know if any of you have visited houses in Tel Aviv, the houses of the 1950s, 40s, with this terrazzo that you have. We have these inclusions within the floor to make it even uh, nicer. Uh, and this floor was found in the destructions, and it tells us that the destruction happened in a very high fire uh, and very, very violent. Uh, there are many, many small finds. Okay, this is how we reconstruct a building. We are, we are, I will show you now the, where, the kind of lower floor 
where probably it's like more the warehouses, the, the ware rooms. The second floor is like a floor like we had a reception a minute ago. So this is how we imagine, and I'll try to show you how. A, a, a lot of small finds that were found, and let's go room by room, and I will introduce these small finds. Uh, that's the collapse again in room B. You see how everything collapsed down, and then when you peel it off, you find pottery on the floor, uh, and this is how this pottery looks like. This is a perfect example of a drinking set uh, of vessels, all very typical to 586 BCE. Uh, you can hold, imagine, like just imagine what we just had outside and imagine all these people standing with these plates in their hands uh, and drinking, not in glasses, but in ceramic bowls. And also in between the rubble, we found tons and tons of fragments of ivories. Decorated ivories, when, when we excavate, usually people come to say and, and say, did you find gold or have you found gold? This is the first question. And uh, they should ask if we are finding ivories because ivories are even more rare and they, the, the craftsmanship behind these ivories is incredible. And we know of ivory collections. I'm not talking about an item here or there. Ivory collections were usually found in palatial compounds at Megiddo of the Late Bronze Age, Samaria of the Israelite kings, Jerusalem was missing its ivory collection. So here is the first evidence for ivory collection in Jerusalem. This is a very tiny panel. You can see in centimeters the size and understand that it's something like that. And then it's decorated with these rosettes. And in the middle, there is the tree of life, symbols that are usually associated with the Assyrian world. But they were brought over. The tree of life is the same symbol that you saw on the stone capital before. So they were kind of adopted by, um, uh, by, by the Judean society. We found these things in, in fragments. You can see that. And something like 1,500 1, fragments and little pieces from sifting that was, was done. And we, we, we were unable for a while to even to try and glue them together. We had to find a specialist that can deal with small fragments of ivory like that. And at the end, she was able to reconstruct three panels like the one you saw a minute ago. So three panels that were reconstructed, but like you do a jigsaw with your kids at home, she counted, oops, sorry, at least 12 corners, uh, sorry, corners that are enough for 12 panels like that. So there were 12 identical panels, uh, and they are probably inlays that were used for furnitures. Uh, that's how uh, we understand them. And the, the, most of them are the, the one that you saw. There are some with geometric style that you see here, and some with a lotus flower, an Egyptian symbol that is adopted by the Assyrians and then goes into Jerusalem. Nothing is foreign here, but nothing is really local, like isolated to Jerusalem. And here are these geometric signs. And we think all together that uh, these ivories were not produced in, in Jerusalem. There are no people who are able to produce things like that. These are attached specialists that are sitting within the palatial compounds, probably in Assyria. And we have to imagine that this is kind of a gift exchange. And if indeed it's, these are inlays within a furniture, uh, we suggested this reconstruction. This is like a throne bed uh, that we know that the king of Assyria are depicted on them. And you can see the ivories, how they fit. So, for the time being, if somebody finds better uh, examples, we, I don't mind. But at the moment, let's, for our imagination, we can imagine like a throne bed like that, standing on the upper floor with this drinking vessel that we just, vessels that we just saw. And next to them, we found this seal. This is a seal that somebody was probably wearing here. This is his way to be known in the world. It says, Le Ikar, so belonging to a person named Ikar. Ikar is a farmer, but don't think about it literally. It's just a name. Uh, son of Matanyahu, God gave. If it was Netanyahu, we would be on the news, but it was Matanyahu. <laughs> but actually, it's the same meaning, okay? Nat Natanyahu, God gave. Matanyahu, Matan, uh, God gave. So it's a tophoric name uh, of a very typical Judite person. Ikar is a more rare name. And maybe this person was living there. You'll see in a minute that he's not the only person uh, we got involved. So here you have the couch on the other part floor, the, the drinking set. And then we go for a minute to uh, this collection of jars that were located in room C. They lo were located with a lot of burnt material, uh, 
Some of them looked like beams, some of them looked like burnt furnitures. And uh, we have a PhD student who just began to work, and hopefully she'll be able to say whether there were furnitures here. It was very, very hard to conserve them. In between them, we found this stack of pottery that you see here burned down. This is a close-up view of the, of the jar, and you can see here that somebody stamped the jar on its handle. That's the same rosette symbol that you saw on the ivories. Now it's a symbol used by the monarchy to say whatever is the content of the jar belongs to our taxes. Like we, it belongs to us, a Judite uh, symbol, and it was done before the, the, the jar went into fire at the pottery production. And here you see it closer. That's the uh, collection of jars that you saw there smashed, standing in that room. I don't know how anybody moved there. And uh, we always kind of think what, what was held in these jars, especially when you have a jar that has the stamp of the monarchy. So it's part of the tax collection. And Ayala Amir, a PhD student at Tel Aviv, uh, did with us residue analysis, which is extracting molecules from the clay and reconstructing what was within, inside the vessel. Uh, and for her understanding, the vessel was, this vessel and others were used for holding wine, which is not a big surprise. The bigger surprise was that the wine was uh, enriched and flavored with uh, vanilla, vanillin. Okay, so next time we're doing a reception, I'm ordering a, a vanilla wine, a tasted wine. I'm not sure it's that terrific. Uh, vanilla, everybody thought that it's coming from the old world, new world, sorry, from Mexico, down here. Uh, but already in another residue analysis from the Middle Bronze Age, so even older, uh, there were uh, vanilla remains at Megiddo, and this is the second time we see vanilla in, in archaeological context in the Levant. And uh, the two articles together show that vanilla grows naturally in tropical areas in Africa and in India. Uh, so it was not domesticated like it was domesticated down in South America or Central America, uh, but it was probably exploited and then brought over to the main centers like Egypt or uh, Ashur. And from there, it, it made its way to the hands of people uh, like people in, in Jerusalem. The kingdom of Judah at this time is uh, in control of the Negev, the Arad fortress, Be'er Sheva uh, center. This is the place where the trade routes were passing, the Arabian trade routes that brought things from Yemen all the way up to the coast towards Gaza. So this is what, what they were doing as part of the Assyrian order. And probably there were other things that were the, the trade was moving for, but while it was moving, also spices were traded uh, and so on. And actually we know, sorry, I went the wrong way. Uh, we know of vanilla, uh, sorry, of Arabian, the presence of traders from uh, Arabia in Jerusalem in the 7th century BCE. These are uh, inscribed shards with Arabian uh, letters on them, dating to the 7th century BCE, that were found in Jerusalem before, and nobody really knew what to make of them. And maybe they, this is the, like a colony of traders that are responsible for enriching the wine with vanillin. Uh, maybe they should be blamed. Uh, and, and it gives, it, like it's an echo for the story of Queen Sheba coming down to Jerusalem uh, and so on. So we have the drinking set, we have the drinking uh, salon, we have the wine cellar with the uh, vanilla enriched wine, and we just need a person now to add to that and give a name to that kind of uh, very uh, uh, exclusive building. This is a bulla, this is a product of the sealing. We had the seal before, now that's the clay that was sealed by, uh, by someone and the name was preserved, very perfectly preserved. And what the name says is Le Natan Melech, that's his name, so belonging to Natan Melech, is uh, not a king, that's just simply his name. Uh, God gave, again, it's God gave, it's the same ga game on the names. Uh, and he doesn't need his father to be known in the world. Uh, his title is Servant of the King, Eved Melech. And servant of the king is not a servant in the way we understand that this is civil servant. This is a very high official within the Judean uh, palace system. And actually, Natan Melech, the servant, we know of him from the biblical text. And this was found in, in one of the rooms, in room A. Uh, when Joshua is making his reforms, uh, he's describing as taking the horses. This is in the, in the uh, uh, second book of Kings. He's taking the horses 
and gives the, to the son at the entering of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Natan Melech, the servant. So uh, Joshua is bringing us to something like 630, 620 BC. Uh, and Natan Melech, I don't think it's a coincidence. We were very careful when we published it. We said that's an example of Natan Melech who is ha having the same title. Very careful persons like Chris Holston and so on came to us and said, why are you so afraid? It's probably belonging to actually the same person. Uh, and I'm not claiming now that we are seeing the chambers of Natan Melech because the bulla is a, something that was sent from somewhere else with a letter or something like that. But I think what we are seeing here, and what this video, in, sorry, but let's go like that. Uh, this flyover of the building is a chamber. Okay, so that's the idea. And uh, we, we hear about this uh, idea of a chamber many times with Datan Melech and others, uh, in high office, a place uh, where people were uh, entertaining guests. It's not just a place where you work. Okay, our concept of an office, an office should be understood, I think, more in relation to social, political activities that ensure kind of maintenance of the social order and the splash out of uh, elite that is always important uh, in, in the society. I think this also, this building is showing how much the Judean elite were completely connected to, to the world around. They are getting spoils from Arabian trade, they are getting things from Assyria, they are very well rooted in the world, they are not sitting there isolated in a capital in the highlands, and uh, this is really a heydays uh, for the Judean elite. Oops, sorry. Um, and that's how we reconstructed that, uh, that moment uh, in Jerusalem uh, that was come, somehow saved because it was destroyed if we started with destruction. Uh, so we have to understand that's the moment that the city was destroyed uh, and uh, it probably flourished until that moment. And, and if we kind of try to understand the entire city, then the temple was standing definitely in the seventh century and think on Temple Mount, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the spring has moved and the city has tilted and the western slope where we are now, we saw, saw the buildings, is becoming the more central part of, of the city with maybe the palace located between us and the temple and buildings that were found in, a, in the first belt are more important than what we found. But we have a kind of a, 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 an opportunity to see the second belt of buildings uh, royal connected buildings uh, within the build, within the city. Do I have a, one more two minutes? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have that image of Jerusalem uh, uh, by Nehemiah, his night tour, uh, where he sees Jerusalem is destroyed, and Nehemiah is a hundred and something years following uh, the moments that uh, we we just saw and kind of remembering glorious Jerusalem. They related it to Solomon, but it doesn't matter at the moment. It's just the glorious, the idea of glorious Jerusalem. And I want to go back. Uh, I'll go back to one of the images you saw before. Yeah, the image of the destruction. Let's go here. Sorry. This image. Uh, we found remains from the Persian period. And what's interesting about them is that they are located here, where you see the measuring, measuring, measuring stick that we have. Uh, and according to our understanding, during the Persian, Babylonian and Persian period, there were people living in next to the building, sometimes within the ruins and sometimes next to the ruins. So nobody was able to move the stones. It was too much. It was a pile of, of stones that took us three years to excavate. So with, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, techni technology around us, uh, and they just brushed wherever they could and lived next to the ruins. The first impression would be, oh, these are probably refugees that are staying around and, and living within the destroyed quarters. But we analyzed their food remains and they are eating fish from the coast and they are eating fish from the Red Sea. They are connected. It's not an, it's not an uh, isolated community of refugees. They seem to be well off. It almost seems like it's a choice to live within the ruins. And we began to explore other parts where the destruction of 586 was destroyed, and the Persian period is always like half building is standing destroyed and half building is being used by new occupants, like, like a choice that is done in order, to, um, in order to maybe not remove the glorious Jerusalem until some, some a higher force 
will enable the, re the kind of re recreation of glorious Jerusalem, uh, and so on. It's also uh, like if, if it's a choice, it, uh, think, of, think of a child that is growing in, a, in, a, in an environment like that 100 years after the destruction, when he wakes up in the morning and uh, he, he asks his father or his mother, what is this? And they say, oh, this, this used to be glorious Jerusalem. It may explain why the destruction of 586 is so well preserved in our memory. It wasn't something like we, we, some of us go to on Tisha B'Av and read about uh, in the in the uh, uh, they read about the destruction of Jerusalem uh, and and fast on that day and it's a very distant Jerusalem and it becomes like a concept of destruction for a hundred and something years it wasn't a concept of destruction it was a very physical destruction in there every day which may help explain why this destruction survived so many generations in the in the memory. Uh, not of only of the Jewish uh, nation, I think, or for everybody's. Uh, yep, so that's the regeneration of Jerusalem, and then I'm, uh, I'm missing now this, the slide of thank you, but this is just as well. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Ivory itself is an elephant for sure, okay. uh, and, and, and not a hippopotamus. There, there is a student of, uh, in Haifa University uh, who is doing Ariel Shochat. Ariel Shochat is doing a sourcing of uh, uh, ivories in general, and he worked with us. Uh, he was able to tell us that it's probably an African uh, elephant, but he wasn't uh, he, like he didn't want to publish it yet. So, don't quote me. Uh, and we don't have a date for that. Uh, so I cannot say exactly how did it reach the, 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 the craft production place and, and whether the, like if there's a place where they are producing all of these and then they go to all the palaces or are these uh, artists that are artisans that are traveling between palaces. These are questions that kind of remain vague. I, I ask because uh, I know in the late Bronze Age, and people find this amazing, but in the late Bronze Age there were both elephants and Hippopotamia hmm. in uh, the Syro Palestinian coast. Yeah. Uh, and so I was wondering, so you answered yeah. elephant, but uh, I don't know when they disappeared from there, but that would be 600 years or 800 yeah. years, depending on what that dates to earlier. And yeah. uh, I was yeah. wondering, you know, it, it might be a local source. Uh, uh, it doesn't look like that. It looks like. Uh, no. uh, well, uh, I'm sorry. Like, yeah, no, no, it's like it can be elef uh, African elephants who are growing up in, in Syria, exactly. Palestine. We know from Assyrian sources that they had some kind of an equivalent for a zoo. Like they brought animals from the places where they <coughs> conquered. It was part of the spoil of the war. Uh, so you don't even need the community in nature. You can have them uh, growing there. Uh, there is so much that we don't know about these ivories, uh, the way they're produced because they are so rare. Uh, also the symbols, sometimes you think maybe they can help you say where these artists are located. We located them at uh, Assyria, but Assyrians who are dealing with ivories are saying these are all northern Levantine ideas. Uh, so who knows how it's moving around. And maybe they were also used for more than, like these are early Iron Age ivories that were taken as spoils of war from Samaria, brought to uh, Ashur, and then brought as presents to Jerusalem. It's, it's also possible. Yes, please. What are some of the modern political challenges that you face as an archaeologist excavating in uh, Jerusalem today? Okay, uh, let me move. <laughs> let me let me breathe and move to a more uh, uh, relevant picture. Uh, I think this picture uh, 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 they are there. Okay, I can't ignore them. We we are, we see ourselves as digging in a glass house. Uh, the place is in conflict. Uh, we are getting demands from both sides to prove something, to prove a point for someone, right? to prove that it uh, belongs to us, or to prove that. And I uh, think that the only way that uh, I'll be credited for my work is if I don't try to prove anybody's points, except for finding things about the past, which is, which is my job, uh, and keep this place as the uh, uh, is the most scientific place that archaeology can, can be at that time. 
Uh, it wasn't like that, the excavations before. It took time for the kind of the, the excavations to pick up to and to come to a neutral place where whatever will be decided about that spot, I, I do have my opinions, but it's not my business. Whatever will be decided here, I'm okay with that. But if we don't excavate it now, it will not wait for another generation. These, place, these places are being built over, and while they're being built over, they are being ruined. And I think this is for, for the sake of humanity, you defined it as a... As a a World Heritage Site, I think for the sake of humanity and the memory, these places have to be researched and by top-notch uh, archaeology. And that's, that's where we deal with that. Yes, please. Yeah? They just kept this article in the New York Times, I think, about finding the ivory and the vanilla. And I think what I got from it, I didn't read it carefully, was that uh, talking about the wealth I think the wealth of the people who lived there at that time, and they were indicating that it was a different group of people than the ordinary people. And I'm wondering what you... This, this is the elite of Judah at that time. We are seeing the capital city of, Ju of Judah, and these people are, are active very close to the temple, very close to the palace. It's not the, it's not the palace, it's not the palatial compound itself, it's, I think it's the next belt. And uh, yes, they are enjoying a lot of wealth. The biblical text will kind of you hear of you know being blamed for uh, overuse of uh, resources and so on. So the biblical authors, I don't think, like these persons. They saw them as kind of uh, an elite that needs to be uh, hunted down or something like that. I think if you read the biblical text with with the, what we are finding, you maybe we are seeing conflicts within the Judean society. Some people appreciate more the Assyrian presence and enjoying the fact that you can, can I say it's almost like Tel Aviv and Jerusalem today? <laughs> Without, uh, some people are more kind of segregated, that's, let's keep our culture to ourselves, and some people are saying, let's be part of the world and enjoy the, the wealth of the world. And, and I think this is the, the sector that we are seeing. You wanted to ask something? The city of David is beginning where, this bus is standing and to the right. So for all of that and going southwards down, down slope. Walk, walk over there. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> now you have. Okay, so that's, that's the beginning of the city of David. These things all the way down towards there. Uh, yes, please. Are there places that you, as an archaeologist, would like to dig in Jerusalem that will never be possible? Uh, <laughs> you see the. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, of, of course it's tempting. But what, uh, when, when we began, uh, to, my, we, I mean my generation of excavators, uh, began to work there, uh, I spoke with a person called Joe Ziel, he's working out for the Israeli Antiquities Authority, and he was doing other excavations while I was doing it. That, and, and, and I said to him, you know, our generation thinks big will not be found. Now it's the, kind, the time for the residue analysis, for the fine tuning of the picture, and so on. And then a year after he began to excavate, he found a Roman theater under Wilson's Arch, so it's somewhere there uh, below these buildings. A uh, beautifully preserved theater from the time between the rebe rebellions, before, after the first rebellion and be before Bar Kokhba's rebellion. And I said, okay, fine. We, there's always a chance to find something so very, very surprising in Jerusalem. Never give hope. Uh, but I think as long as it's done together with scientific tools like that, then it's more meaningful. Yeah. Uh, there, there were other questions there, so yeah, please. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about the ivory also, and I was thinking, coming from Africa, that it could be related to the Queen of Sheba from Ethiopia before Queen of Sheba and after. There was always trade with Africa and Ethiopia. I wonder if that could have been connected. I think the stories that we're hearing about Queen Sheba coming to Jerusalem are written on the account that there are connections. But I don't think there were direct connections. Uh, uh, Judah was placed in where the trade was passing by, the desert routes, that Tom has researched in, in other periods. 
and I think we're enjoying a trade that was more global. So the, the big actors in this trade are the Assyrians, the Babylonians after them, and the Egyptians. And we are seeing here the clients of these big empires playing, and, and, and so they are, they are part of a network, but I don't think there are kind of, there are no Judean representatives sitting in, in Ethiopia and, and getting these things back to Jerusalem specifically. That's what I think. Uh, just a second. Please. Yeah, I just uh, I read a review of the book. I can't remember the name of the author. I think it's a colleague of yours from Tel Aviv University who claims that in the book that Judaism only became perspective in the first century BC. It means that people started practicing the religion only at that period of time. Yes, his name is Yonatan, uh, and he's from Ariel University, he's not from my university. Uh, the, the book is creating a lot of controversy. I will not speak for him, he, says he has his opinion. I, I think he's talking more about halachatic Judaism. Judaism changes all the time. I, I will not use the name Jews for people living in Jerusalem in, the first, in, in this moment. I will call them Judeans, and I think uh, I know if you notice that. There are people living in the Judean monarchy under the, Jude under the Davidic dynasty. Uh, this is not the same Judaism as the Judaism of, that comes back from uh, Babylonia, and it's not the same Judaism that will be after the destruction of the temple by the Romans. So Judaism as a, as a, as a religion changes all the time. And what he is noticing very nicely is that in the first century BCE, there is a, a, there is a marked change in the way people act in their behavior. Like, uh, the, yes, the, you, you, you suddenly see. I would think that the period that you're discussing isn't there archaeological evidence that Judaism was practiced similar to what was practiced in the first century? Not by the material culture and not by the finds. Uh, the finds are different. Um, I'm not trying to say that these are not the descendants of these. I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that religion is a very flex uh, We think that it's a very uh, conservative thing, but it's actually changing all the time. Uh, with the, and so uh, when you say Judaism, usually you mean Second Temple Judaism. And, and that's a marked difference than First Temple, biblical laws, and so on. This is exactly like with the, the Samaritan saying, if, if you look at the book of the Hebrew Bible, then we follow the laws of the Hebrew Bible better than the Jews that are following the Talmud and the Mishnah and so on. And here I crossed the road from things that I don't understand, so. <laughs> I say, yes, Tom, please. Um, so you mentioned scientific methods. I think you were part of a big project with the Weizmann Institute on uh, radiocarbon dating, not only your site, but many sites in, in the city of David and other parts of Jerusalem. What, what's the impact that uh, mega radio carbon project, uh, you'll have to invite me again for a lecture with, on the C14 in, in a different uh, opportunity. But when we began the project, there were two or three C14 dates in Jerusalem, which is such a crucial site. And we are standing now, I think, with 400 C14 dates. Uh, they were done also on periods like the Roman and Byzantine period. They, they, even though they are coins, they were able to better date the theater that I mentioned before and the building of some arches and so on. And uh, we are quarreling over a big article about the Iron Age. So hopefully uh, we'll stop quarrel to some point and then... Uh, <laughs> Is Israel involved? No, 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 no. <laughs> there are other people to quarrel with. <laughs> uh, we published on, on the Middle Bronze chronology we, and we are... Hopefully in half a year there will be a, a paper on Iron Age chronology with the 100 and something dates, changing the, the many things that uh, uh, are kind of conceptual now. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My, my pleasure. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank <laughs> you.